Well, good morning. Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started today. We're glad you're here. Come on in and take a seat and we'll start our uh, worship service as we look to the one who's worthy of our praise. But again, we're glad you're here. We pray God will bless you as we rejoice in the risen Christ. And today we're also uh, coming before the Lord's table and we hope that um, our hearts are prepared to I receive these elements symbolically representing uh, the blood and body of Christ. And as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him and rejoice in his ultimate and great sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. But we're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, um, we want to um, continue to pray for those who we have been praying for for quite some time. And uh, Tim Williams, uh, of course, at Memorial Hospital, Jerry uh, Bershewski at uh, Hospice House in Lockport, and pray for Jerry. He was he was doing he was doing so well uh, for quite a quite a good stretch. Uh, just had a little bit of uh, a setback this past week, so pray pray for Jerry and uh, uh, praise report uh, Linda Ross. Praise report Mike is coming home. So praise the Lord. She has been through a lot with her, her son, and uh, he, he was uh, really in some very poor health and shape, and it was truly a miracle of the Lord that uh, that is uh, turned in a, in a wonderful direction. So Linda needs your prayers as a mom, and she has been through, uh, through quite the season uh, in, her, in her life as well. Uh, also, we want to lift up Marianne Villar. Uh, Marianne Villar recently... Uh, diagnosed with breast cancer and um, um, some further tests and possible uh, other locations of this uh, situation going on. But pray for healing and God's touch upon Marianne's life. Uh, Frank Dorgan, uh, we're continuing to pray for Frank and recent tests that he has had and uh, continuing to pray for Danny Thaler and uh, Patty uh, along their journey's way here as Danny continues to seek the Lord's healing and they all I know appreciate uh, your prayers in a, in, a, in a great and appreciative way and if we uh, ever leave anybody else out it's not intentional there's a prayer mailbox out in the front foyer please uh, drop a request in there give a request on a piece of paper to one of the ushers so that we might be able to uh, pray uh, for your need and also we want to uh, be praying for Carol Zemendorf and, and her family, recent uh, home going of her mom, and uh, a lot of loss uh, in Carol's life lately, and so we want to want to lift her uh, to the Lord and also her, her family. Elena also, um, she, she uh, flew back to um, Italy for uh, passing of her brother, and so I don't know how, uh, maybe Mary, I don't know coming home today okay so uh, she's coming home back to the states today and uh, she was there in time to uh, see her brother before uh, he passed so praying for these families as well and also a um, couple anniversary wishes today we want to make mention of uh, Bertha and Jack Campbell uh, celebrating 66 years of marriage and so we want to praise the Lord for Jack and Bertha <clears throat> And also Dave and Pat Klein, I think they come in at uh, 57 years, right? Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I had a couple comments, Dave, but I'm going to reserve those comments because I always get myself in trouble. So anyway, congratulations and praise the Lord for uh, these years of marriage. And uh, let's go to the Lord. Father God, we praise you today for your goodness and grace, your mercies that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We rejoice in you. We celebrate you, Father, today, and uh, Lord, our relationship, our walk, and, and the cross of, of Christ today that uh, brings forgiveness of sin. And Lord, we, we just praise you for the sacrifice for mankind and to all who would turn, Lord, to you and recognize their need uh, for a Savior. We thank you for the preaching of your word, the teaching of your word. Pray you'd bless, Lord God, in, in, in this place and meet the needs of those who have gathered here. 
And Father, help us to become uh, more like Jesus, Father, in these uh, days that uh, we walk with you. Again, Lord, we pray you to encourage hearts, and it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, announcements. The Nightingale Ladies uh, Widows Group gathering after church today. And if you have any questions about that, they'll be meeting in the back area of the church, and you can get with, uh, get with them and pop in there. They'll be glad to speak with you on that. The Young Adult uh, Ministry on uh, Monday evenings uh, at 6 o'clock, and A.J. leads that for us, and uh, he's doing a wonderful job. We praise the Lord for his teaching of God's Word and instilling that in the young adults. And so thank you, A.J. Also, Young at Heart Luncheon at uh, NFBC, 11 o'clock start over at the church there, and our group and a uh, few churches gather there for time of fellowship and uh, good food. The Bellinghams uh, put that on. And so we thank the Lord for that, that opportunity of fellowship. Also, the men's retreat. Everyone, guys, and this is for you who signed up to go to Otisega on uh, this coming Friday. We'll be meeting here at the church parking lot about 3.30, quarter of 4, and uh, to carpool uh, to get down there in time for dinner and checking in Friday evening and checking out there uh, about Saturday after lunchtime. And so if that pertains to you, uh, that's the uh, schedule that uh, we're looking at. Also, ladies, out in the foyer, many of you have signed up for the uh, Spring Forward um, Ladies' Day. Our guest speaker and presenter is Dr. Kristen Jacobson, and there's handouts for the itinerary along with the sign-up sheets out in the foyer. But sign up as quick as you can so that we know uh, the count uh, to prepare for the, uh, the luncheon that goes along with that as well. And also Dan Whiting. Uh, Dan can use some help uh, joining the uh, cleaning team at the church. And we appreciate Dan holding down the fort in so many ways and others who came alongside during Dan's illness. And we uh, could use uh, people on that team. It is not about cleaning uh, all together, all at one time with the task at hand. It's at your convenience, and, and, and Dan can navigate that uh, as well uh, for you. Uh, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Jim Woods to come up, and Jim has uh, something he's going to share with you and then show you, show you a video uh, today as well. Good morning. I've got a couple announcements for you. Uh, Tuesday on the 30th of uh, April this month, a week from this Tuesday, uh, the fellow from Op Overwatch is coming to give a uh, presentation. The church is looking to take them on as a missions partner, and but everybody's invited to come and see the uh, presentation. The short version is they minister to uh, military, police, and corrections officers that have been through trauma. Uh, it's a wonderful operation. So if you can, come on out. It's, it's going to be 6.30 on the 30th. Uh, <clears throat> I encourage all the trustees to get here early uh, so we can see that and the elders, if they're available, to come out and check that out. So, uh, and it's a wonderful operation. And the second announcement I have for you is the National Day of Prayer is Thursday, May 2nd. And they're going to open the church up from 9 to 11. Uh, it says they'll have a continental breakfast, and if you don't think our nation needs prayer, then uh, I suggest you have a talk with a few of these fellows up front here. <laughs> so, but uh, everybody's welcome to come out to that, obviously, and uh, we do need prayer warriors. And there's a short video, it's going to take you a few years back in time, but uh, I think you'll recognize uh, who it is. sustained our people in crisis, strengthened us in times of challenge, and guided us through our daily lives since the first settlers came to this continent. Our forebears came not for gold, but mainly in search of God and the freedom to worship in their own way. We've been a free people living under the law with faith in our maker and in our future. I've said before that the most sublime picture in American history is of George Washington on his knees in the snow at Valley Forge. 
That image personifies a people who know that it's not enough to depend on our own courage and goodness. We must also seek help from God, our Father and Preserver. Thomas Jefferson once said, Almighty God created the mind free. Abraham Lincoln said once that he would be the most foolish man on this footstool we call Earth if he thought for one minute he could fulfill the duties that faced him if he did not have the help of one who was wiser than all others. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is the promise God gives us in 2 Chronicles. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That promise is the hope of America and of all our people. Together, let us take up the challenge to reawaken America's religious and moral heart, recognizing that a deep and abiding faith in God is the rock upon which this great nation was founded. National Day of Prayer, Thursday, the 2nd of May, 9 o'clock, there'll be a ceremony here, and you can gather uh, here at the church, and uh, thank you, Jim, for that information this morning, Thursday, or excuse me, Tuesday evening, the 30th, again, uh, up Overwatch coming to make that presentation, and you're all invited, as Jim uh, shared with you just a moment ago. So at this time, we're going to ask uh, Doug McGee if he would come and ask you to stand as we open our service with a hymn this morning. may not be familiar to a lot of you, but it's familiar to too many, and so we'll, we'll see how we do. Here we go. Thank you, Doug. 
At this time, we're going to uh, invite our elders to lead us as a church to the Lord's table this morning as we observe uh, together a communion this morning. the bathroom's been in it. <laughs> Didn't hear that. <clears throat> well, welcome to the Lord's table. Communion. Communion. In preparation for communion, there's a couple things I'd like to share with you, just to lead into the uh, service. Uh, there is uh, a scripture in Acts chapter 2 and verse 44, and it says, All those who had believed were together and had all things in common. We use words like common and community, uh, communion. And the word "come" refers to being together, being together. And <clears throat> so what does that mean here when it comes to community or communion? Well, we're in the same building, right? But that, that's not what it means, okay? Um, if, if you read the context of First Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is addressing an issue in a Corinthian church that's not good. And I think in the 17th verse, he says, we don't, you're not coming together for the better, but you're coming together for the worse. And, and you can read that section, but Paul is addressing and rebuking the Corinthians for the way they're coming together and the purpose they're coming together. Paul challenges us in Philippians chapter 2 to have put on the mind of Christ. <clears throat> he says, have the same mind, maintain the same love. It should be united in spirit, intent on one purpose, not selfish, but with humility of mind, and regarding one another is more important than ourselves. So we come together in fellowship. We are united in a unique fellowship. We have some commonalities, and we don't unite because of our ethnicity or education or personal interests or even maybe even a denominalized, uh, denominational religion, but we come together because of faith in the person of Jesus Christ. So communion is an expression of this unity and Jesus, who not only saves us, but he sustains us, and he unites us. Uh, for those who have come by faith, we invite you to take part in the elements today. And uh, for, for, for children that are here, parents, uh, we, we'd ask that you manage that. You know uh, where your children stand as far as believing in Christ. So... Uh, anyone who is here and, and has that belief in Jesus Christ is welcome to take part in the service. <clears throat> so we come by faith and we have each other as we come by faith as brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's kind of a family setting. But our family setting here for the, for the family of God, it goes beyond our earthly stay. It's eternal. Now as you look around and the person next to you, is a born-again believer, you know you're going to spend eternity with him? Is that good or bad? <laughs> you're going to spend eternity with him. But we have Christ as our heavenly father. So it goes beyond our earthly families, and our faith is eternal. First John says that whoever loves God must love his brother and his sister. Okay? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in, in what we 
normally kind of view as a text of a communion in um, the Lord's Supper setting, it challenges us to examine ourselves. And what are we looking for? We ask the question, how are we doing with loving our brother and our sisters? And <clears throat> we're going to do, have an opportunity to do that and ask ourselves that here in a little while. But you know, as in any family, it, it's common to have some ups and downs, isn't it? Uh, and, and I don't know, it usually happens on a Sunday morning when you're getting ready for church, you know? But just like our earthly families, we do. We have ups and downs. But we, as believers, the scriptures challenge us to be uh, sharing in each other's joys and each other's sorrows. And Paul says if one member suffers, then we all suffer together. And if one uh, uh, member is honored, then we all rejoice together. And, and, and we as believers have strengths and we have weaknesses. I don't care who you are today. Um, I know this front row has strengths and weaknesses by their own admission. And we share in those, and we support each other. And the body of Christ is, support, is to support each other. And we work better together and united than apart. You know, many ministries focus on the externals and what's appealing. And what really makes the body of Christ appealing is the inner heart and the inner person. It's appealing to each other, and not only to each other, but to the lost, to show Christ and the mind of Christ. And it's an encouragement to a lost and hopeless and dying world to be united and to show Christ and to put on the mind and the heart and the humility that Christ is an example. So as we come to the communion table today, um, we are to examine ourselves, prepare ourselves, ask ourselves, am I truly united with my brothers and sisters with a heart and a mind of Christ, humility, do I esteem others better than myself? <clears throat> am I selfless? Am I, am I not selfish? And can we say that together as a body? So I invite you, um, as we go, just before I pray and the men come to distribute the elements, let's have a time of um, just silence and ask ourselves and examine ourselves how united am I in the body of Christ? And do I exhibit those characteristics in my inner self um, to contribute to the, uh, to the body of Christ? So let's bow in prayer. And I just ask you to be quiet for a little bit and consider um, and examine ourselves as we prepare to take of the elements and um, celebrate Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Let's pray. Father, as uh, we come... We, we thank you for the privilege of the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for uh, scriptures that direct us and give encouragement. And, Lord, that are a reminder of the great sacrifice that your son Jesus made for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that the debt is paid. The scriptures said that he bore the iniquity of us all. And, Lord, what a great price was paid. And, Lord, uh, thank you for eternal life. 
Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you. Lord, I pray that we would have servants' hearts to serve you, and Lord, that our hearts would be united in the person of, of Christ, and Lord, that we would uh, uh, be a testimony to the lost and the dying world, and Lord, that we'd be an encouragement to each other, uplift each other. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy and grace. And I pray, Lord, as uh, we enter into this time of uh, uh, sharing and, and the elements, Lord, that it would be a great reminder of uh, the price that was paid. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> as we come to uh, the bread, we give thought to what it is in substance. Uh, the Bible uses the expression, the breaking of bread, in many different ways and many different references. Uh, we can see that throughout scripture uh, as, we, as we do read through it. One way is in Acts 2, 42 through 46. Interestingly enough, as I came this morning and Dave and I and Angel spoke, uh, Dave and I had the same scripture and foundation. And so I, I take a little bit of a different aspect, certainly uh, echoing Dave's comments, but in this scripture, it describes the early church and the breaking of bread as part of their fellowship. And the scripture reads, and they continued steadfastly, and some versions say devoted, uh, in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and to prayer. And as I reviewed this scripture, as I looked into the scripture, it, it spoke to me in a way that, uh, as Dave did about the, uh, spoke on the, on the fellowship communion portion, but also with regard to the apostles' teaching. As we come together as a body, uh, we have our Bible hour, we have our time of uh, worship in the word here in the morning. Uh, the disciples took time to be devoted in teaching, hearing God's word, that they might know better uh, God's message to them, God's teaching to them, how God would call us to uh, serve him uh, and be in the community as representative, as ambassadors. And I won't speak to fellowship because Dave did that, but in the breaking of bread, uh, oftentimes when we're together as friends, and it, probably an older term, but let's, let's get together and break some bread. Let's have a meal together, uh, part of that fellowship, and being together and talking about your life and uh, you know, being almost enmeshed with one another. Uh, what do we do here in church? Sometimes we say to our friends, oh, we have to go to lunch sometime, or we should get together for dinner sometime. We want to be with you. And of course, that's an image of God wanting to be with us and us wanting to be with God. And then lastly, to prayer, to be together in prayer. Prayer is such an important element uh, in our relationship with God. It draws us closer to him. We're able to share the concerns of our heart and our lives, put our requests before him, and just be drawn closer to him and have a, a sense of his participation in our life, to hear his voice. Another way is the breaking of bread that is observed in the Lord's Supper. Uh, which is what we're going to do this morning. Uh, the breaking of bread at the first communion table, it was observed thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. It's a way of remembering that very first celebration of both Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and the institution, or the instruction, if you will, of the new covenant referred to in 1 Corinthians uh, 25, which Angel will speak to in a moment. Uh, from the Last Supper until now, each celebration of the Lord's Supper includes the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup and of the fruit of the vine. Specifically, let us remember the significance of the broken bread. It is a symbolism of Christ, the bread of life being broken for us on the cross. At that first communion, which we call the Last Supper in the upper room, Jesus describes the breaking of the bread this way. This is my body, which has been broken for you. And yet, not one bone in Jesus' body was broken. Uh, and it wasn't broken on the cross. We can see that in John 19 and Psalm 34. Yet the legs of the, um, of the thieves on the cross, they themselves were broken. And again, his, not one body, bone in his body was broken. In Isaiah 53, 5, we see some prophetic uh, instruction here, or information here, um, that reads, but he was pierced for our transgression." He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, 
and by his wounds we were healed. We are healed. His skin and flesh were torn and broken by blows with rods and fists, by whippings and scourgings, by thorns, by nails, by a spear. His body and soul were separated each from each other by death, and by that brokenness and faith we are healed. As his people, as his children, we participate in his sufferings and his brokenness. We are being broken by sin as he was broken by the punishment he received, and he did so willingly for our redemption, which stems, stems from the love of God. That's where it comes from, because God loved us. During the Last Supper, as described in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 39, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of him, and let us do so. I was uh, I was I was reading a book uh, this week, and uh, I was preparing for this this time. And um, uh, interesting thing kind of stuck out uh, in this particular book uh, a a thought, and the thought was uh, of first importance. Uh, the scripture declares in First Corinthians fifteen three, that is like saying, "Remember this. This is this is the." The first point, this is the foundation. If you don't get anything right, nothing else will make sense. Nothing else will connect or nothing else will matter. First of all, or know this, it says, For I pass unto you as of first importance what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. This is of first importance. This is like a three-legged stool. Uh, it, it cannot be supported apart from these truths. Jesus Christ is both the offering and the offerer of that which is offered. As the offering... He shed his blood. Then as the offerer, he took that which was offered and offered it to God. Hebrews 9, 12 to 14 says this. Speaks of how Christ, through the eternal spirit, offered his life's blood to God. His blood is our redemption. It purchased us back to God. 1 Peter 1 18 through 19 speaks about a redemption by the blood. It says that ye are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Hebrews 9:22 speaks of forgiveness through his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. 1 John 1:7 says we are cleansed by his blood. The blood of Christ, Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Romans 5 and 9 says, we are justified by his blood. Being now justified by his blood, we have peace with God. Romans 3.25 says, we have been reconciled through his blood. For God set him before the world to be, by the shedding of his blood, a means of reconciliation through faith. Hebrews 13, 12 says, we are sanctified through his blood. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Colossians 1 and 20 says, we have peace through his blood. And having made peace 
through the blood of his cross. Hebrews 10 and 19 says, we have obtained boldness to approach the throne through this blood, his blood. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And finally, Hebrews 9, 12 says, we have obtained eternal inheritance through his blood. By his blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. It is his blood, the blood of Jesus. We sing, what can make me whole again? Nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen? And so as we thank the Lord for his blood today, I would invite you, um, let's pray, and then we will take the cup together. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, today for the grace of God, the grace of God that leads us to repentance, O God. Your goodness, Father, your faithfulness, Father, that uh, teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Lord, we love you, Lord, today, and we are thankful, O God, for the grace that you bestow upon us in the giving of your Son. We thank you, Lord, for the blood today. We thank you, Lord, for the redemption that's in the blood of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that our lives are set apart by the blood. And Father, we give you praise, O oh God, that the blood, Lord, satisfied you, Lord, your, your justice, O oh God. When you see the blood, you said, you will pass over us, O oh God. And we have been passed over because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we've passed over from death unto life, O oh God, and we thank you for it, O oh God, today. In Christ's name, amen. Let's take the blood to get uh, the, the wine together. Children said, Amen. For as often as you drink of this cup and eat of this bread, we celebrate the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice for us until he comes again. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2 He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God, and whom, in whom I trust. I pray that you have placed your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, men, for bringing us to the table this morning and the opportunity to examine our hearts before the sacrifice of the cross of Christ. Well, at this time, we're going to call upon our ushers to come to receive the morning offering and ask you to give back to the Lord a portion of that which God has blessed you with as we worship him uh, with our giving this morning and invest in the eternal work uh, that he has purposed here through the church.
Father, we celebrate you this morning and in your Son, the Lord Jesus, who overcame all that was against him that we might have life and life eternal. And we thank you, Lord, that the, the grave was overwhelmed. And because you live, we too uh, can live eternally through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for coming to the table this morning, remembering your great sacrifice, your shed blood and, and broken body, which was offered up for us. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you. We pray, God, that today these gifts would be used for the furtherance of your glorious message to all who would believe. Father, may your church, your people, uh, be spoken of as those who walk in the truth and those who walk fulfilling God, your call upon our lives, not just individually, but as a church. May we be found faithful. Bless uh, the gift and the giver today. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray and ask. Amen. Just before the message, we'll ask you to stand as we worship the Lord together in song this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. See you higher, lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you. Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy See you high and lifted up Sing in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy Of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. 
Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I When sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I Righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you, Lord, I need you, oh, I Oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Who I am, who I am, who I am. 
Because you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, it's a love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak. It's so unexplainable. I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still and you love the love. You're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are. Who you are, I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Your good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. seated. Well, we have um, come to the last few verses in the third epistle of John this morning, and we have talked about this for about, this is the third week, and talked about a key verse earlier in the uh, text, and we won't uh, elaborate on it too much, but it was one of the two key verses uh, in this third epistle. And John the writer to Gaius, a fellow and co-worker in the gospel message and ministry, uh, Gaius, uh, as we said, had the gift of hospitality and ministering to those who were contending for the faith. In other words, um, those who go out in the field, those who are on the front lines, are enabled by those who support the team. And this is exactly what uh, Gaius was. He was the one who was enabling others to exercise their gift of preaching and teaching uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John said, I have no greater joy than this, than to hear of my children walking in the truth. If you get nothing else out of this series, may it be that that defines you, that defines we as a church, that we are known testimonial by people of the truth. We walk in the truth, we've been changed by the truth, the truth has set us free, and we proclaim it, and we make it known without apology, for it is the power of God unto salvation uh, to all who believe. No greater joy in the heart of a believer than to know that those who have been invested in spiritually are known for walking in the truth. Uh, the second of the, um, the two key verses found in verse number 11 is we'll look at uh, 11 and following. Um, but before I do that, a little, little bit of confusion, you know, in uh, your, your Bible and the presentation of Scripture and the version that you have before you, uh, some of you might have a 15th verse, and some of you might just have 14 verses. And uh, I don't want you to lose sleep over that. I don't want you to uh, think that uh, there's some her uh, 
heresy going on here. There is uh, an addition to Scripture. No, a 15th verse uh, here, not so much the uh, importance of the number count of verses, but there's a, a second thought in the, uh, in the conclusion, if you would, or in the final blessing that, that John brings. It's just separated out. It's just portioned out so there's clarity to the, to the text. And so um, it's, it's a blend of the, those two verses, a couple different thoughts that, uh, that John conveys, and you'll see that uh, in, in just a moment. But he says in verse number 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil. You say, well, that's pretty basic. Of course not, you know. We're not going to imitate that which is evil, but imitate uh, that which is good. And the one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil uh, has, not, uh, has not seen God. Two very clear examples in Scripture given, given leading up to this 11th verse. Uh, Gaius set forth a, a wonderful example, a good example, and, uh, um, to me, uh, excuse me, uh, Diotrephes, not Demetrius, we'll get to him, but uh, Diotrephes was the one who was setting the bad example as a leader of the church, leading people astray, not coming under the authority of the apostles, even uh, excommunicating people if they would not adhere to his guidance and uh, if they showed any type of allegiance to the apostles, then uh, they would be uh, told basically to leave the church. And so the good example here is set in the fact that God is a good God. God is a true God, and those who truly follow him will be likened unto this God in obedience, coming under his authority, walking in the truth as he is the truth, walking in the light as he is in the light, uh, walking in the truth, and also producing works of righteousness, yielding our members that were once used as instruments unto unrighteousness, now are being used for the cause of Christ, unto righteousness. And uh, John exposes, as I said, uh, the atrophies here for excommunicating those who um, were, were a part of that church in the region of Asia, and he was uh, asking these people to, to leave, and John did not want to follow suit. I'm not going to excommunicate you as you have excommunicated other people, and uh, their obedience or their following through the teaching of the word that has been entrusted to you to give to other people, but I'm sure John didn't want to follow follow suit, but in church discipline, he also had in mind the work of reconciliation. And so we are never to, we are never to kick people to the curb. We're never to give up on people. We're serving a God of the second chance and the umpteenth chance, though we do not excuse uh, wrong behavior within God's church. I remember years ago, uh, we had an usher in the church here that, uh, you know, we, we tell our ushers, you know, to kind of look out for certain things and keep things in order and all that, that kind of stuff. If there's a disturbance, you know, kind of address it or what have you. And this, this usher came up to me after service one Sunday, seemed rather frustrated, and he said, Ron? I said, what? And he said, sometimes I feel like the ushers are dogs without teeth. I said, I got gotcha. you. And what he meant by that was, we've been given the instruction, but to administer it is an entirely different animal. And what was going on in this, this church where the Apostle John steps in, what he does, he's, he exposes wrong behavior, wrong behavior within Christian leadership, wrong behavior as far as giving guidance and direction to people uh, because uh, uh, the individual who was leading this church uh, Diotrephes, he had his own program. He wanted to be first. He wanted people to be uh, in, in their loyalty to him and not the apostles. Though he had an authority over him and an accountability, he wanted to be the end all, and his ministry was about him. And so what John does, he exposes him. He exposes him. He exposes him for leading people astray, exposing him for not uh, uh, coming under the authority of the apostles. And so he is the one who has given this extra opportunity, this extra chance, but at the same time, he was the one who was 
uh, told of and warning other people that uh, be very careful in following his leadership. But moving on this morning from all of that, another, another great example given to us here in the text is Demetrius in verse number 12. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and not only from uh, people's expression but from the truth itself. And that is an important statement that is made in the text. And we add our testimony, our rubber stamp concerning him. Uh, we are speaking on his behalf as recommending him. And he, by the way, is recommended to Gaius to participate in the ministry of hospitality. And so John said, you can take it to the bank. You can... Uh, hear our uh, character reference here about Demetrius. Not only do people speak of him as being a good guy and uh, being observable, but also he is saying that his testimony is not just because people say that he's a good man and a godly man, but that his life is consistently and constantly that which is given to the truth. Now, as a pastor... I am pleased when I have the opportunity to recommend somebody from this congregation to an area of ministry within the church or maybe to a arm of the church, uh, such as the gospel uh, mission that we have downtown or a Hope Club in, in, in some respects there that some of you have served in and have served well. So Demetrius was spoken of being a faithful servant. He had a character res reference from the apostle himself. We back him up with our testimony in support of him because he has followed the truth that we have imparted to him. He is walking the walk, he is, he's talking the talk, and he is an example of carrying out the truth. He's solid. His life is based as a, a witness of the truth. And I pray this morning that can be said of us. It gives me great joy as a pastor to be able to, to say to someone down at the, at the rescue mission, Hey, I got a guy. Or there's a lady in our church that is known among us that has that walk with Jesus, and that is what people think of when they think of her or where they think of him. But not only that, but they love the Lord our God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and they are a student of God's Word, and they're grounded in truth. And, and the, the authority of Scripture is what resonates through their teaching, and through, most importantly, their walk. They talk the talk, talk, and they walk the walk. And that is who we want to recommend. And that is who we want to invest in. And this is what the apostle basically is saying. Known uh, by uh, their testimony, known by being one given to the truth, and our testimony backs them up. And then verse number 13 and, and 14, however, that is uh, dispensed uh, in, in Scripture that is before you there. Uh, nothing's excluded, nothing's added here. Just a little bit of extra numbering for thought, thought purposes. But uh, notice verse number 13, he said, I have many things to, to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with, with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and I will speak to you face to face. Well, basically what's going on here as this uh, epistle, this letter to Gaius is wrapping up, he is given an explanation why the letter is so short. Very, very, very simple thing here. Uh, you know, Gaius might have thought, well, is there another page here that didn't get in the, didn't get in the mail or didn't get uh, uh, passed along here through the Pony Express? Back then they had snail mail, you know, and uh, things might have got lost in the, in, in the process. We complain when, when uh, mail doesn't get somewhere, you know, within a day or two. I wonder how long it took for the transfer of communication and, and letters in, in that day. So here, here's the deal. Gaius might have been surprised that the letter was so short. I haven't talked to, talked to uh, John in, in, in so long, and uh, this is all he has to say. And so it's a short letter, but he gives that explanation for the short letter. He prefers to have a personal conversation face-to-face -face, communicating within the family of God. And this is the essence of the family of God. This is why we call this, in other words, we call this the, the, the body of Christ. 
That's why we, we call it uh, the family of God. And the guys referenced that as we, uh, we came to, together around the Lord's table. There's commonality. There is uh, that which we have at the cross that is part of our conversation. You can go out to lunch with anybody and talk about the weather. You can go out with anybody and, and have an activity or go to an event, and we can do that as human beings with, with each other. But only with those who are part of the household of faith can you talk about your walk with Jesus as they're walking in the truth and as they're walking in the light, as you're walking in the light. And only among believers can you compare notes because we're, we're kind of living in the same situation. In a world that is no friend of grace, this is how we live out Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'm very encouraged that I never have to walk this journey alone. Jesus never leaves us or forsakes us, but he allows us to be encircled by those of like faith, those who uphold the mantle of truth. I think, I think it was Chip that spoke about uh, the apostles' doctrine, you know, in, in the book of Acts. Um, they were going from house to house sharing the apostles' doctrine. Why is it phrased that way? Because it's a possessive uh, presentation within the language that says, this is what converted me. This is what brought heart change. This is the message of, of hope that brought me from darkness into light. And we have this commonality. That's why we talk about the family of God, the body of Christ. And this is why the short letter. I want to give you kind of a summary. I want to kind of give you an outline about what we're going to talk about when we get together. And so page two is coming. And it's going to be in person. Nothing wrong with letters, because those who have been among us, those who have moved away, those who have taken up camp somewhere else, uh, you know, Florida has that saying down there, doesn't it? Don't New York my Florida. Thank you, Angel. You know, and, um, oh, you know, when Angel came in this morning, all I could see was this tie. Did you see that tie? I'm going to borrow that thing. That, that is some kind of tie right there. Glory, did you give him that for Christmas? That's gorgeous. So, anyway, I'm, side note, because you're my brother, I'm going to call you and borrow that tie. Anyway, I don't know how I get off on things. You, you, you don't want to be in here. That's all I know. But a summary given to Gaius. I'm coming. I intend to come. I intend to enjoy fellowship with you. And I hope in the family of God, it is the same. We look forward to being with one another. We look forward to breaking that bread with each other. We, we look forward to being in one another's company. We look forward to talking about what Jesus has done or what I've learned from God's word lately. And if you love your brother and sister in Christ, those are the kind of uh, discussions you're going to have. What have you been getting out of, of God's word lately, Austin? What have you been getting out of his word? And you know what? If you see each other coming and, and you haven't been doing those things, you know the questions. You know, you're, look, you're looking for that short exit out somewhere, so you're not, you're not asked that, that question. But you know, isn't it wonderful when a brother or sister in Christ asks you those kind of questions because they care about you spiritually? What's God been doing in your life lately? You know, what, what have you been experiencing? You know, I like to hear the praise reports, Linda. I like to hear what God is doing in the lives of people, even though the journey is, 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 uh, is uh, engulfed with a lot of sorrow. We see God in the midst of it. We see God sustaining us. I, I was talking to, I was talking to uh, Tim the other day. You know, that, 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 that hospital bed, you know, in and out of many hospital beds over six months. You know, never, he hasn't been home in six months six seven months now you know it's wonderful when you see a hospital bed become an altar of prayer and when you see when you see uh, 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 an emergency waiting room becoming a, a place of praise you know that is something that christians do and that we're unique people uh, we're a royal priesthood um, you no, know, Jan. Jan got a. I don't know if Jan is here today, but Jan got a praise report. Justin went in for for brain surgery, and and they were painted the picture that you know this this doesn't look real good, and everything was just about opposite of what the doctors had projected. And she said the 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 waiting room turned into a a, a place of praise. 
place of worship. Even if the report wasn't good, there still can be praise because God is who he is. And, and God is the one who will see us through whatever, whatever we face. But by way of conclusion, and because of time this morning, um, and you know, we purposefully, when we do the Lord's Supper, when we come before that time of communion, uh, we've talked about the elders, we've talked about it, and we've talked about it with some of you. We don't want it to be an afterthought or a tag on kind of at the end or just something you, you, you get done in time to, to go out for lunch kind of thing. We want it to be the centerpiece of our service because it is the centerpiece of Christianity. It is the centerpiece of our faith. And it needs to be brought to the forefront of importance. And so you got a good message this morning around the table of the Lord. And I, and I hope it was meaningful to you. But this final blessing, it includes two things. That's why there's two different verses in here, 15, if you have that. It is still in verse 14, however the bread is, is sliced here. But in part of the final blessing, there's a reminder of, of uh, the common bond and the ties of all those who are of the household of faith, even separated by miles, still brothers and sisters in Christ, and uh, it's all because of Jesus. Greet them. Greet them by name. Talk about them uh, with, with others and, and be encouraged from the testimonies of those who are still keeping on. There's brothers and sisters that I have known for years and I haven't seen them in a long time. But just like uh, it resonates through the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John, when I, when, I speak, when I hear of you, whether I'm with you or I'm not with you, I hear of your faith. It brings great joy and peace and fulfillment to my heart to hear of your faithfulness. And so no matter if you're here at Forest View or if you're in another congregation, if you're in another state, if you someday uh, New York the Florida kind of thing, we love you and we're a part of the family of God. And we're doing this together and we're making up all that God has, has brought about. In the second part of verse number 14 or leading into a 15th verse, he says, peace to you. A letter that was filled with contention because of uh, uh, diatrophy diatrophy and in and, uh, and, and that congregation and conflict that was going on John appropriately concludes this letter with speaking about peace to you in the midst of this stress in the midst of this uh, difficulty in this mi in, in the midst of these things that might unexpectedly come your way not only does he pray for peace upon them but he prays with an expectant heart that no matter the season no matter the uh, report no matter what you're going through as a Christian you can and you should have the presence of peace even in the midst of difficult and trying times peace is not the absence of storm it's not one or the other it's peace in the storm it is peace in the unsettledness of life and the seasons that come our way that we would never want to have to walk through or experience but let me share with you, the experiences that God allows to come into your life are not contrary to his love for you. Those experiences are for you to be uh, uh, being conformed, not to this world, but being transformed into the image of Christ one moment at a time. And uh, looking back even in the weird way that Christians can, I thank God for that diagnosis I thank God for that journey down that road that I never wanted to go to because now I know that God has brought me forth as gold and I depend on him and I learn things that I would have never learned had it not been for that situation now we don't pray that way God bring it on but sometimes we pray God whatever it takes that Christ be formed in us right and in the meantime he says peace unto you now, when, when John talked about peace as uh, unto the church and wanting the best for these believers, he was talking about something more than just, you know, everyday peace. You know, like you don't have any waves or you don't have any troubles, you don't have any conflicts, you don't have any, any difficulties. And let me, let me run through some uh, scriptures here with you this morning that's, that support the heart, of, the heart of John. But keep in mind, Peace is not the absence of sorrow. Peace is not the absence of the storm. 
Peace is not the absence of those things that you sometimes are praying that God would deliver you from. And it has come to pass, but it hasn't come to stay. It's here for a season, and it's here for a reason. And God is not some father up there with a, with a whip. He's a God of grace, and his, and his throne is a, a place of mercy. It is a place where he understands the tears and the cries of his children. But let me give you some of these this morning. 2 Thessalonians 3.16, and it says, May the Lord of peace himself grant peace in every circumstance. Calling upon the one who is the Prince of Peace, the author of peace, the resource of peace, where peace finds its origin, and I'm calling upon him that you experience Jesus in every circumstance that you're facing and that you know that God is on the throne. It doesn't mean that you delight in every circumstance. It doesn't mean that it produces, it produces joy in every, every circumstance, but it is an opportunity to see Christ in the details and that he is teaching us and he's growing us uh, by faith. Uh, John 16 and, and verse number, number 33, these things I have written to you, these things I have spoken to you, that you so that you may have peace in me that you may have peace in me. And then over, excuse me, in the gospel, according to John here, yeah, how's the, how's the Bible work? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, there we go. John chapter 16. No, I want John 14 to verse 27. This is a great verse. Peace I leave with you, Jesus speaking. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not lose heart. Do not allow your heart to be troubled, nor let it be fearful. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives. This is talking about the Prince of Peace himself by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and just before the 27th verse, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to send you this, this Holy Spirit, and I will, and, uh, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all those things that I said to you. They'll make sense to you when you're in the midst of certain things that in the moment you don't understand, but when you face these things, God is sufficient for that moment. May you know his peace in the moment that is sufficient for you, just like his grace. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your times of weakness. My peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. This is something that so often we need to fight against. Don't try to find peace with the physical eye in the, in the moment by the circumstances. Look deep within your spirit where God resides, giving you joy that is unspeakable and full of glory that is so much more than the circumstances that, that happiness comes from. It's not about happiness. It's about stability. It's about being sure and, and, and being viable in the moment and uh, being, in the, being in the world but not being of the world and knowing where you stand and why you, you stand there. Gaius was known and Demetrius was known by people, not only testimonial speaking about them, but you could see through the actions of their lives that they were students of Scripture and their lives resonated on there. Peace was spoken to the waves when Jesus was in the boat with his disciples. Peace be still, and the waves obeyed him. They awoke him from sleep, even that the waves would obey him. And that is the peace that is spoken into your life and the peace that is spoken into mine. book of Isaiah 26 and verse number 3. We are kept, or he is kept in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That means my heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. Though the storms of life come, the circumstances are up and down, 
Nothing is guaranteed. You are the steadfastness and the hope that never wavers. You are the same yesterday, today, and, and, and forever. And my heart is at peace, and I trust you, no matter, as even Job said, though the stars of heaven fall, yet will I put my trust in you. Why? Because you have proven to be exactly who you say that you are. You never know how deep your faith runs until your faith is tested, until it's put to the test, until it's tried, and see how deep that peace reveals itself in the midst of the storm. Romans 5.1, having, having been, past tense, having been justified by faith, we have something. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we've been justified by faith, God, through the fruit of the Spirit, has given us peace of one of those tools to sustain us in a world that is not very peaceful. In Psalm 119 and um, verse 165, those who love your word have great peace and nothing shall cause them to stumble. Nothing will cause them to move. Though the rocks are moved, the mountains moved, and, the, and, and they fall into the sea, yet will I trust you. And it's an abiding peace that God gives us in the midst of all that we face. And let me share with you folks, if we're going to stand the test of time, especially the time that we find ourselves in right now, you need to have and allow the Prince of Peace to be enthroned upon your heart. So that hospital room becomes a prayer room. That waiting room becomes a place of praise, of offering to the Lord, possibly with lifted hands, and thanking God for his healing touch in a circumstance that everyone else counted somebody out in. And you are not done here until God says you're done. And you are here to do the work of the Lord, and some of the greatest work of God is done through the tool of suffering. And Christians are looked at, what a man of faith, what a woman of God, what a testimony, because their lives exhibit the truth that they spoke, and it is now that the truth that they live, and it sustains them, and it keeps them. Not to say we don't weep, not to say that we do not sorrow, but we are like the weeble-wobble toys. We weeble and we wobble, but we don't fall down. Amen? Amen. I know I'm, I know I, I know I'm keeping you late. Yeah, well, a few of you don't mind, but anyway, um, let me give you let me give you one give you one parting gift here. Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two and, and verse number fourteen. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jews and Gentiles, lost, saved, into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one man, thus establishing peace. We have never lived in more of a divided world, in a divided country, than we are living in now. And until this truth resonates in the believer's heart, we shall continue to be a divided people. And verse 16, and might reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross, not through anything else, not through politics, not through a social debate, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. You're not going to have peace because of who's in the White House. You're going to have peace because who sits on the throne of your heart. Let's, in this year that is before us, 
know that the peace of God can rule and reign in our hearts and it will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We need to have the mind of Christ. We need to be able to see things clearly. We need to be able to decipher through the deceptions of the enemy because even the elect of God are deceived. In this day, may we be the church and may we make much of Jesus in these last days. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. We thank you that it is the final authority. We thank you, Lord, that it is the credibility of our testimony that we would be found as people of the truth, not people of opinion, not people of gimmicks, not people of angles, not people of persuasion, but our trust in the Word of God causes us to rest in the sovereignty of the one who sits on the throne and the one who sits on the circle of this earth and the one who rules and reigns in the affairs of men. And we thank you that that brings us much peace, abiding peace, lasting peace for all the storms that would come our way. And we do pray for that peace, not as the world gives it, but as, Father, you can only bring it through the Holy Spirit that resides in us, that it would well up within us, that even to the point that people would ask about the hope that is within us.